Hello boys and girls ladies and gentlemen this is Nishant and welcome to another episode of the Nishant Gurg show this show is for people who want to live a fulfilled life through mindfulness practices and personal transformation my job on this show is to invite world class performers to share the practices to live a fulfilled life this episode guest is Dr Micra Hamilton Dr Micra Hamilton is co-founder and CEO of Epiron Center for Human Potential, a precision performance ecosystem that curates limitless life. She has spent 30 years in the US Air Force Reserve Command where she served as a human performance subject matter expert. She is a human systems designer and creative disruptor in the field of precision human performance, creating a new paradigm of what is possible for human flourishing. Dr. Hamilton skillfully works with a precision systems based approach to optimize performance and potential by leveraging genomics and epigenetic lifestyle strategies along with scientific research advanced biologics and leading edge technologies these highly successful strategies address the physiological emotional mental and energetic aspects of the human system to enhance life improving our relationship with the internal and external environment and how this impacts the collective environment dr hamilton speaks internationally on the focus areas of the epigenetics of the human environment performance breathing conscious leadership peak psychophysiological performance and stress optimization now let the episode begin Dr. Micra, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. You have served you have served in United Air Force for more than 30 years and you are a human performance subject matter expert. You work in precision performance ecosystem and you help people in optimizing performance and potential by leveraging genomics and epigenetic lifestyle strategies. This is very very scientific. Can you please explain to our listeners how they can change their performance and how they can upgrade and optimize their performance to the next level? Sure, I would love to do that. Thank you. You know, it's it's interesting because we we are sitting at, at an intersection uh of time where we have the opportunity to take advantage of the precision nature of each of us as individuals and the way to take advantage of that to actually be more precise about how we're living our lives uh, optimize our systems and even enhance them is is really predicated on the fact that we're all unique and while our genetics are our foundational blueprint or the hardware of our system is 99.9% the same it's the teeny tiny percentage of our uniqueness that makes us so remarkable and so when we have precision data on us that foundational blueprint and we we use that as a kind of a stepping off point of precision and we go okay this is this is who i am this is what i've inherited uh and what can i do with this genetic blueprint to really optimize and refine this human experience so this is where epigenetics comes in or above the genes and it's and it's simplistically this how does nature and nurture interact so we've got our foundational blueprint and we live a very specific way we interact with our environment we interact with ourselves with each other we interact with the the ecosystem of the planet and every interaction that we have provides an input to our genetics and that input allows us to express them beautifully or to create disease state and this is where we have sort of uh, we're holding the reins of evolution and our own destiny because the actions we take create beneficial changes in our genetics and what kind of actions we are talking about here 
you know, it's if, if you just think about the complex nature of living life. So if we talk about, you know, the foundational things that influence the system, um, you know, we look at sleep and those who have really great sleep structure, good sleep quality, you know, they're hitting all of the stages of sleep in an ideal way. The metabolic debris of the brain from the day of thinking and working and doing gets cleaned out. And so we restore that system at night when we're in those ideal states. So sleep is one of the biggest epigenetic modifiers and one of the most important things that we can do to keep the human system both in a healthy state and, and importantly, uh, moving more toward this this joyful, thriving way of being that we all would like to experience. So sleep is one. You know, of course, everything we eat matters. And, and you know the debates of the processed food versus the whole food. You know, most people have a genetic makeup that the Mediterranean diet is a strong foundation as a starting point. And then from that strong foundation, we can look into the genetics and say, you know, here's what your body prefers from a protein perspective, from a carbohydrate perspective, from a fats uh, perspective, so that we can really promote healthy muscle growth, uh, decreased fat amounts, and decreasing inflammation and the things that cause um, disease states to begin to set up in the body. So sleep and nutrition are two of those, and, and there are so many more. And these are... So sleep and nutrition, they are two of epigenetic lifestyle strategies. Is that correct? Right. And so, you know, with, with nutrition, you have nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics. And, you know, one is eating for our genetic makeup and one is eating to enhance or support our genetic makeup. And so when you, when you have that foundation of your genetics, you can really begin to fine tune your eating strategies, the timing of your eating, the quantity that you're taking in, uh, and, and really support the system in a, in a beautiful way. So every, so what I'm understanding is every gene is unique and we inherit that from our parents, from our, you know, great grandfathers, from our, you know? Yes. And uh, so we get to work towards embracing our genetics, what is serving us in a better way, not in a way that we get to have seven to eight hours of sleep or we get to eat in this way. It's not one size fits all. We get to work accordingly to our genes. Is that correct? It is. And, and you know, it's such an important point that you bring up this, you know, when we talk about the transgenerational passing of the genetic code, you know, we have to all kind of kind of step back and recognize that everything in our ancestral lineage is actually informing the way we show up right now and the uh, heritage that we pass to our children, to our grandchildren, and to all future generations. And so as we begin to totally recognize and and embrace the fact that all of the actions that we take in our life and all of those that have been taken before us create this new human species moving forward. We're able to understand that things like uh, trauma, you know, famines and things like, like COVID, things like Holocaust and, and many of the things that have happened on this planet are really playing into how the human uh, stands up. And so if we, if we know that, we also know that the beautiful experiences that our ancestors and that we ourselves experience can be passed on to. And so we are able for the first time ever to truly take a big lens and go, okay, if we're going to really take responsibility for ourselves and for our future generations, what if we started doing preconception planning and we looked at the genetics of the mother and the father before they, they make the decision to conceive? We create thriving health and well-being in both the mother and the father, you know, within six, at least six months prior to conception. 
then the baby is is really um, grown in a womb of nurturing, uh, good nutrients, good mindset of the mother not being stressed and the father being supportive. Then when the baby comes, we can look at the baby's genetics. And from that place, program the, the baby's eating. You know, we know that there's a lot of gluten issues and grain um, intolerance yeah. and dairy things. If we already knew those things, we wouldn't be guessing. We would say, you know, it looks as if there might be a possibility of, say, having, having issues with dairy. And so if that possibility were there, other solutions and strategies could be laid in where we didn't move that individual child into disease states of allergic reactions or, um, you know, look at the peanut allergies. There, there are just so many things that we can do to ensure that the human system doesn't go into disease state by proper pre-planning of the way we interact with our environment and all of the multiple intakes that we put into the human system. I love what you just said, pre-planning, not just preventing when the disease happens. And when a child is born, from that point to when a child becomes adult, do you think our genes and genetics, if I'm, if these words are interchangeably, if I'm using these words correctly, do they change or our genetics remain same from the point we are born? They, they are the same, right? So, so that foundational blueprint is fixed short of, you know, mutations, but that's a, that's a whole different uh, conversation. But what's, what's the most uh, critical, beautiful, amazing thing to recognize is that that's where epigenetics is the game changer. So while, while the blueprint is fixed, say for instance, there's a, there's a gene that's an APOE gene and it's basically around fats. So if you have a certain expression of the APOE gene, you have, um, you know, up to 20, 30 times greater risk of having cognitive decline as, as just one example. But we, we know that that carried an evolutionary advantage in Africa, right? And, and creates a um, higher resistance to viruses. And so we take that and we go, okay, what are the things that, that make that gene negative for us? And we know that saturated fat intake is negative for that gene expression. And so it's a simple thing to say, hey, you know, you've got this predisposition. And so a way to really create a thriving um, internal environment is for you to keep your saturated fat intake or animal fat intake below 5% per day. And, and we know that that makes a big difference. And so it's in identifying the things where we can make a difference that changes the expression of the gene. So the gene stays the same, but the way it expresses is altered. And that's our power because that's our choices really create that. Mm -hmm. I did not know all these things up until before this podcast. So uh, we are talking about optimizing human performance. Uh, we talk about human performance in sports in different fields. But we hardly talk about at the epigenetic lifestyle level. And we are not changing our genes. We are changing the expression of our genetics. Correct. So let's say when you're working with a client, an adult client, for instance, you are working with me. I'm 32 year, 32 year old. And I have never done all this thing in my life. And I feel pretty healthy emotionally, mentally, spiritually. I feel very balanced overall. And But I feel like I want to optimize my human performance, optimize my overall development to take my game to the next level because I want to thrive to the next level. So what are the strategies from point A to point B for any, for any of our listeners who want to thrive, they feel stuck or if they feel everything is fine, but there is always a scope to improve and to thrive to the next level. 
Mm -hmm. And and thank goodness, right? Because that's part of the fun is recognizing that there's no end point. You know, we really are as a human system, we're limitless, but we've got so many things, so many belief systems, um, so many inputs that are keeping us from really reaching that potential. So, so the first, the first important thing is what you said. It's the desire to um, be even better than you currently are, because that's the number one thing that drives this uh, optimizing and enhancing human performance. Beyond that, what's really essential is that we have the precision data of me, right? So every person does life differently. You know, for instance, you do stress a certain way, I do it a different way. And for me to believe that I'm going to tell you how to do stress based on how I do it makes zero sense, right? So, so for, for instance, if I'm stressed and meditation is working for me, it doesn't mean that. Does it mean that? It will work for you as well? <laughs> well, the, the thing is we know scientifically that meditation beneficially um, changes genetic expression in as little as six weeks. So meditation is amazing for everyone now. That being said, it's also very different. So you might do, um, you know, mindfulness meditation. I might do auditory entrainment meditation, or I might do walking meditation in nature. And so it's really about finding What's, what is, what's your system saying? And we say with the example of stress about how I do stress. My nervous system has markers that tell me whether I'm in chronic fight or flight or, or always activated in stress or whether I'm, you know, chill and I sit more relaxed than stressed. And, and recognizing that neither too much stress or too much relaxation is good for the optimal performance of the system. And so you, you get the data on you. And if you just said, how do I do stress? Part of that comes from the way your parents did stress. Part of it comes from, you know, the strategies that you've been exposed to, the strategy that you've tried. And so what you do is you, you, you just kind of do an awareness thing. How do I feel about the way I do stress? If I say, you know, I'm good, I'm really good at stress, uh, but could I have a little more stillness? Could I listen a little more deeply, right? This is more fine tuning of those areas that you already feel that you're doing a great job and in. This is optimizing. You're not Correct. changing anything, you're just optimizing. Right, refining, enhancing, tweaking, fine tuning, right? And based on, of our, based on our genetics. Based on, in part, absolutely, the genetics as a foundation, but it's one, it's one input. And so when I talk about precision data and I say, how, how has stress shown up in your body and mind over time? There are evaluations that, um, you know, put sensors on the body and really challenge the system gently to see how you do stress in life. And normally, you know, we see the outcome of that in um, the breath structure. So breathing in the chest instead of in the stomach, breathing fast instead of breathing slow. And we see it also in heart rate variability, which is a big performance enhancer. How, so, how can we get precision data for each individual? You, you really have to find someone who, who specializes in this complex systems approach because you know, what most of our medical system has done is it treats disease and it, it looks at what's sick. Now, you can't get precision data from that because if you go in as a healthy person wanting to optimize and talk to your doctor, they say, you know, why are you here? There's nothing wrong with you. And, and instead, you know, we can look at it like I'm here because I want to improve my immune system, my quality of life, my health and well-being, my relationships. Um, so you, so you've got to find people who are looking through this lens. A lot of lifestyle, uh, medicine people look through it. There are some integrative and functional people who look through it. But anyone who has a complex systems approach that is data driven, where you can get the advanced testing, uh, is a really good place to begin. You can even wear a tracker. You know, a lot of people are wearing Fitbits and Apple and, um, 
you know, bio strap and whoop. I love Garmin personally and all of our clients wear Garmin. And, and it isn't that these things are perfect yet, right? But they give us windows of insight into our human system. And, and then if we change, if we make changes in our strategies and we see beneficial changes in our tracker and we also subjectively notice those things, now we've got a really good start of the precision uh, kind of implementation and how well it's working in the system. So data and then data over time with inputs carefully added or removed gives us more precise information. And we, uh, we, we all have unique DNA blueprint and with all these lifestyle modifications, we can epigenetically shift our DNA blueprint and enhance right. our life. And right. most of the time, we human beings feel that we have hit that threshold level. We are not able to break that wall. And then we feel we need something else to come in our life to thrive. But there's so much information overload on internet. There's so mm -hmm. many coaches, wellness coaches, health coaches, not to discount anybody. It just, there's so much information. And how to go from point A to point B if, like you mentioned that we can wear Garmin watch, we can have Apple Fitbit app or watch. But if somebody, like I'm totally new to all these things. So how can somebody like me can really optimize their performance? What are the tools and resources they can have or they can hire any mm. epigenetically mm -hmm. coach? If you can please explain on that. So, so I think that everything begins with self-awareness, your, your own personal interoception, right? So, so if you, you, you know, said, okay, I want to be better at what I'm doing. I'm in a good place. And so I want to be better. So it, it starts first with in what areas would you like to be better? Get very specific. If it's, I want to, I want to expand my awareness, right? That's a, that's a strategy that's multi-pronged where you might do some meditation. You might do some entrainment work in the brain. You might do some nervous system modulation in the body with heart rate variability. I mean, it's, it starts first with the very specific goal. I have these desires. You can't do everything at once, right? So people can generally go, what area of my life would I like to uh, enhance? or optimize, whatever your language is. And then from that starting place, you can begin to find resources that are in alignment with that goal. And so if it was, I'm super stressed, I feel um, on edge all the time, and, but, I'm, but I'm really good at what I do, then you could say, well, if I were more efficient, if I were more precise, how much more am I capable of creating or, or rate doing? Um, and, and then that's stress optimization, right? So the focus would go into stress optimization. You would get uh, an evaluation of what your body says and your mind says about stress. And then from that evaluation, you can design a, a specific precise scenario. So if it's that um, your brain, we call it beta head, your brain is in overdrive because you're constantly producing and you never shut it off. Now what happens in the brain is the brain gets stuck in overdrive. And so, you know, there are many ways to decrease that stuck. One of the fastest ways is you get a brain map and you look at what your brain is actually doing. And then when you find the places that are in overdrive, you can actually stimulate those places to bring them back into balance. And how can right. we get the brain map? Um, it's QEEG and they do them everywhere. It's just, it's, this is like with everything else. So you can have a brain map from someone who works with really sick people and you're going to get a different evaluation than if you work uh, with someone who does performance driven individuals because their brains are very different. And so it's finding, it's finding the right philosophy and execution based on your goals and your level of of where you currently are right so sick right. care versus performance it's a very different end of the spectrum so you know on the performance side which is what we're talking about 
You would find someone who's doing performance work, who, who can map the brain, and then from that, they're generally doing neuromodulation, and that's stimulation of, of many different kinds. Um, they're also doing some neurofeedback along with that. And so they're using more advanced strategies that are a little quicker to move the brain than the old uh, traditional sick care neurofeedback that's been in place for 50 years. As part of epigenetics coaching, uh, you talk about seven different fundamental aspects of life shift. Uh -huh. Can you please explain in brief on that? Well, so, so two of them, you know, I mentioned the sleep and the nutrition. Movement is a third, and it's, it's so amazing that six months of chronic exercise, and, and that's defined as 20 minutes three times a week. So just think of that, 20 minutes three times a week beneficially expresses 7,500 genes. 7,500, wow. that's a third of our genome. So the number one thing beyond sleep and really good food, the, one of the number one things that we can do is actually participate in human movement. And we call it exercise in the U.S. because we go to gyms and we do things, but you, know, you don't need to go to a gym to participate in chronic exercise, right? It's can a, we consider walking in that? Of course. And, and in the walking, you can, every two minutes, you can put in squats, you can do push-ups, even if it's against a tree, right? You can do dips on a park bench. You can put things in your movement that actually promote a thriving, uh, you know, muscle system and neurological system. And, you know, any, any movement, and of course there are some that are more beneficial than others, but any movement really helps beneficially express those genes. So then when you, when you look at the environment, this is so critical because environmental interactions impact the genetics so profoundly. And take, for instance, uh, cleaning with bleach. If I pour pure bleach onto my shower floor and I'm scrubbing it with my nose, inhaling the bleach <laughs> fumes, that's going to that's gonna have an effect at the genetic level. So I'm creating an input that's, that's basically taking my system further away from thriving as opposed to closer. So this is where natural cleaning products are better. They're more gentle on the planet. They're more gentle on the human. You know, we use a lot of toxic things in our environment. We put it on our skin. We, you know, clean our hair with it. And um, all of those things actually go into the genetic level and have an impact. And those negative things are physical and they can be emotional, emotional Correct. negative impact. Correct. And that's, that's we, what we call the lane of mindset. We, we name it mindset because... You know, everything around psychology and mental, um, mental illness and mental well-being, it seems a bit polarizing for most people. But mindset and perception, awareness, modulate everything. And so if I'm an optimist and I, I see that the blue sky is amazing and someone else hates the sun, right? There's a very different um, expression going on at the genetic level. You know, a lot of the, um, how do you say, more of the esoteric community would say, um, you know, that, that thoughts are form. And, and it's true from an electromagnetic perspective, the thoughts we think really do create an outcome in the body and they affect our relationships, they affect our ability to um, have high well-being. And so it, it, this is this is why I say everything with epigenetics matter. And, and we can look at it as simply as every input has an effect in the system and creates an outcome. And so what we do, what we participate in, the conversations we have, the news that we watch, um, everything creates an effect. And so we can just simply go, what Man, I feel really um, 
feel really separated and kind of combative right now. What did I do? Oh, I watched that murderous, you know, um, serial killer show. That, that's an immediate effect of watching something that that isn't uh, uh, something that feels good, right? Is it possible that that murder show is positive one for one person and negative for another person? Of Some course. people enjoy that. Why of is that? Course. Yes, and and that's why this is this conversation is so important. We are all so unique, and to say that there is no benefit from something is. I think, I think basically irresponsible, right? Everything has a benefit and also a detractor. For, for us, the way we look at it is what is the net positive, right? Knowing that nothing's all good and nothing's all bad. What is net positive? And, and that's more of the balanced way of being. If I can get to either balance or a net positive, I know that I'm promoting uh, more of a thriving experience. We we try to go extreme. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which is fun sometimes and also detrimental sometimes. So having an awareness that what is working, what is net positive, and the net positive should be exceeding our net negative. Yes, and I and I think that's the way to keep the the system in balance from that balance place or the or the slightly net positive. How can we go more net positive, right? So if you just, if you sat on a spectrum on a bell curve, you know, um, where would you like to be on the bell curve? For me, the, the absolute beginning place is right in the center. It's homeostasis. And from that place, I tend to go all the way up to the high performance piece of the curve because I love, I love being in that place. I feel amazing. I'm connected. You know, I care about others. I want to help. Um, I'm in love with life and, you know, I, I like being there. There are a lot of people who don't like to be there, don't want to be there. And it's why it's so important for each of us to get very present and aware with what do we actually want. Why do you think mm -hmm. some people may not want to optimize their performance or have high performance in their lives? Well, you know, it, this is super interesting, right? And so we can go to developmental trauma to answer that question. Please. When, when one has not grown up in, in what we would call a nurturing environment where our needs are met, we feel safe, and we know that we are okay. When one has been exposed over and over and over to neglect, to, um, you know, abuse to things that are in no way loving, they don't have a frame of reference of what optimized and enhanced even looks like. They may not even know what love is. Love might mean they show me love by beating me. And and a lot of people are not going to, to be okay with this piece, but but this is what we create when we don't nurture are beautiful young beings up through the age of seven because they're programmable and the way they're treated is the way they end up creating life and actually seeing life, sending it on into the next generations. So we've got to get really precise, um, you know, in that age frame so that we're, we're actually preparing people to want to optimize, to want to thrive, to want to continue the human species in a beautiful way. This is very interesting, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Can we change our beliefs through the science of epigenetics coaching? We all have old beliefs, old conditioning, and we all have blind spots, and we cannot see all of that on our own. Through the science of epigenetic coaching and lifestyle strategies, not hocus pocus through the signs of right. epigenetics. Can yeah. we achieve that? Of and course. How? Of course. And this is, this is the limitless state of the human system because everything comes from the actions we take. And so while, you know, while I may have grown up in a violent environment and not trusting of the world, at any time in my experience, I can be exposed to 
what I would call unconditional love or, or love in a way that I haven't experienced it before. And if I'm able to receive that love, to trust that love, I can have a very different uh, safety set point. I can have a different way of, of uh, communicating my relationships. Everything is about that awareness of what do I want? If someone is unhappy and unhealthy and, and say they can't, they don't want to get out of bed, you know, a decision, a decision has to be made, right? Because that's a, that's a very, um, contracted state of being and what requires, what, what is required to get out of that state. So epigenetically is you've got to get up and you've got to move and you've got to in, You've got to um, go in life. You can't be isolated by yourself. Our genetics are not designed for the survival of the individual. They're designed for the survival of the species, of the community. And so we're, we're watching a lot of isolation. And unless people can, um, can actually get with others to have a different experience, how can they change their beliefs? right? If you're around the same people who believe all the same thing, is it likely that you're going to have a different belief? No. But if you suspect that there is a possibility of greater love or greater connectedness or greater creativity, then you have to find the exemplar of that. So, so who is loving? Who is creative? And this is where people kind of do what they do because then they get a sense of what that feels like. That's all the human system needs. Once it knows that something's possible, it takes an action that creates a beneficial outcome. Then they know inside of themselves that they can do more and more and more. And that's usually the way it starts. It's oh, how yeah. you see people stepping out of um, ghettos and, and places uh, that they grew up in and creating massive change on the planet. It's because and they knew they could and they did. And this is not just a motivational talk. This is a science. There is a science behind Correct. that. Correct. Correct. There is <laughs> science to do it. And, and that's what's so brilliant about it because as you work with, so on the mindset side, there's an interesting uh, set of genetics that can um, show a predisposition for someone to emotionally code trauma deeper than others. And so if that person has that genetic expression or potential and then they're exposed to trauma one of the things that's really evidence-based and beneficial for them not to embed the trauma into their psyche is to stay up so if they've been traumatized they've got this genetic expression it's force yourself to stay awake as long as you can because as you go to sleep that emotional trauma embeds deeply in the psyche. That's a, that's an evidence based mm. thing, right? So if I know those are my genetics, um, and I get into a traumatized situation, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like take toothpicks and prop my eyelids open because I don't want to encode that emotional trauma at that deep level. Because right? you're aware of your genetics. Correct. If and, somebody and, is not aware of that, they can do whatever they want and they can, they struggle with that. Right. And that's where precision matters because we truly are unique. And, and once we embrace that and we go, okay, what are my genetics say for me? And what are the proven strategies that make a difference in these things? It's all empowering. It's not, it's not fear based of, oh, I have this and now I've got to do these things. It's, oh, I have a potential for this. I'm going to do these things and it isn't going to happen. Right. So for me, I've got, uh, I've got the FTO gene, which is basically the fat, they call it the fat so gene. And 80% of people who have that gene are obese. Uh, I am solid muscle, right? I'm 120 pounds, super healthy. Um, I have that predisposition, but my whole life I've been athletic. I've eaten good foods. I've slept really well. So I'm not expressing that gene, even though 80% of others who have it are. What's your sleep routine look like? I'm digressing. I'm, I'm making sure yeah. that sleep really mm -hmm. plays a big role. Sleep for me is sacred. And I'm, and I'm going to uh, share with you for 10 years, I didn't sleep very well at all. 
And it was, and I have uh, Alzheimer's in my family pretty strongly. I also have that APOE gene that I told you about earlier. And so I have a significantly higher predisposition to cognitive decline. And I've never feared that, even watching my grandmother 15 years in Alzheimer's and, and her body was so strong, but her mind was gone. Um, it, that didn't create any trauma in me because I know that I have control over it. So sleep is the number one thing in saturated fat. So I don't eat saturated fat, um, but my sleep is sacred. So I, it took me two years, but I dialed in my sleep. I go to bed at 9.30 every night, and I'm not on the dot because I'm not, I'm not that controlled. Um, and I wake up without an alarm at 5 a.m. every morning. I'm filled with energy. My whole day, my energy profile is amazing. Now, when I travel and I go international, sometimes it's slightly disrupted. But even then, mostly, I'm able to use sleep strategies that are, that are highly evidence-based, right? All the information's out there. It's just that most people aren't willing to do the work. So they say, I want to be healthy. I want to be better. I want to sleep great. Um, but they, they won't lay in the discipline that it takes to actually bring your sleep online. I mean, normally 21 days is, is kind of a minimum of you going to bed at the same night, time every night, getting up at the same time every morning. And your genetics matter with this because we know that the chronotype of your genes, your sleep chronotype, um, is tied to your circadian rhythm. If I am a morning person by genetic chronotype and I make myself, I, I'm convinced that because of college, I'm a night owl and I like being up at night, I am going against a foundational, fundamental genetic um, marker. We know that with that sleep chronotype, it matters. It's not, it's not generally one that we can uh, move the marker on. Does it and mean so, that? I'm sorry. Every, does it mean that everybody is a morning person? No, no. Oh, no. Gosh, no. There, you know, we know that there, there are um, night, you know, night owls and morning larks. And, and generally there's, there's kind of an in between. But if it says you're a morning person, and you're convinced that you're a night owl, you may want to consider trying to get on a, a regular circadian rhythm, you know, 10 to 10 to 6, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. And after a time, see if you can reset what your belief system has programmed you into. Because that's one of the places where you don't want to go against your genetic makeup. In, in the long I, run, it's negative. Speaking of myself, I had convinced myself for a long period of time that I'm a night owl but mm -hmm. after reading so many books on high performance listening to people like you in the past <laughs> then I started changing my routines going to bed early by 10 10 30 or max by 11 and waking up early in the morning it I started feeling much much better and it happens all the time with me whenever I'm not able to sleep because of something happened or if I'm just trying to push things harder to make accomplish things, <laughs> I will, uh, if I'm trying to compromise on my sleep, my whole next day is ruined. I'm not co able to think cognitively in mm -hmm. a better way. And it's every time this is connected to my sleep. I'm not sure why, but I have seen this pattern in the last two years. Sleep, if I'm not sleeping, I'm not able to think in an effective way. Positive. And, and you know why? Because you've you've established a rhythm of of you know the ideal way to sleep for you, and you created greater efficiencies. You you actually got a very good taste of what an ideal sleep structure schedule uh, gives you from a performance perspective. So when you when you take that off the table, now you're you're experiencing what most people experience in a chronic way. They have no idea that their level of performance is so depleted because they're constantly functioning at that depleted state. They take it as a norm. And so it's why the people who do the work and show themselves what they're really capable of, it's so worth it. <laughs>
and action is mandatory even when we we know our precision blueprint of our dna in genetics it's action is needed so do you ever get clients when they feel that everything is fine in their life but they want to keep thriving to the next level all the time all of our clients are like that um we we only work with people who are in that category because you know there there are plenty of people um out there who are serving the sick people and who are serving the tired people you know we really work with the we call them the all in right they they know how valuable their health and well-being is they know what they're capable of and so you know sometimes they show up and they say you know I used to be able to do 10 projects super effortlessly and now I find that I I'm I'm struggling even with two I want my old capacity back and that's just simply because they've had a little bit of uh hormonal decline and some things are out of balance and so when you have all the precision data of the system then you're able to uh support the system in places where you've begun to decline uh and I think importantly if if the the younger generation so if we said that by you know of course you would start uh immediately upon birth but if we said that by 20 or 25 you were really going to be focused in awareness on your human system and you were you're basically um looking at you know uh are there any changes right can i get faster can i get stronger can i get smarter can i get more efficient if you're constantly asking those questions and that's your focus instead of have i broken down mm. and and now i need to go fix it because it's broken i mean if we don't break we're not fixing it and all of those energetic resources in the human system are going toward being better and better and better right and life gets more and more remarkable through through the coaching of happy genetics can we cultivate loving relationships in our life of course and so if you think about so so we've got the physicality right and we know we know that a uh, human sleeps at 7 to 8 hours and that's ideal you know we know that we've got to have x grams of protein and all of that stuff the the aspect of the human system it's the relational aspect right so if you started looking at how are my relationships and and what i mean is start first with self how do i relate to myself do i find that i like who i am that i'm uh, contributing and happy you know a lot of times we look at faces and we say um does your face reflect your inner experience is it is it a frown and are you grumpy you know are your are are your um are, are you sitting right <laughs> it does exactly. really like clean are you sitting in a skeptical place or are you sitting in a joyful place now when you look at those people and and this is just a social study right one who is joyful and loving life you can look at all their relationships and they're all really nice and connected the people who who are really angry and don't like life they don't like themselves they don't like other people they don't like the systems and their relationships affect it and you can see it and so that's why i always say you, you start with your relationship to yourself and what you believe um and then from that place what would you prefer if it's if it's empowering and loving and connected great how much more can we be so that's that fine tuning we talked about if it's not if you say i am so stiff and grumpy and i can't go out and have fun you know but i'd like to then do one small thing that allows you to be proud of yourself for getting yourself out there right and 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 this is where it it depends on where you're starting in this curve exactly. but everybody's got to start where they are everybody's got to start from yeah. somewhere yeah yeah <laughs> and before i ask you my last question i would like to ask you what are the books have impacted you in a major way in your life mm, you know the 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 number one book and this is this is so interesting but the number one book that has created impact in my life is called the oxygen advantage and you know i live in a performance world and so oxygen i'm always advantage. the oxygen advantage is patrick mckeown and so i'm always looking for ways that my system can get stronger and and just more um more facile more adaptable to to this human experience 
that book is um, a simple way to understand that how much oxygen is delivered to your tissues, to your cells, to your DNA, to your brain really has a massive impact on on your health, your well-being, on your connected relationships. It truly is about oxygen utilization. And I, you know, I tell people you can either get your oxygen through a tiny straw, a stir stick straw, or you can get it through a pipeline. And the way you regulate your breathing is the big, biggest determinant of that. And so that's the most impactful, practical book that you can use to see where you are in that process, to have precise strategies to up level your performance in all ways. So that's, that's when how the breath work is getting very popular in the performance correct. industry. Correct. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, Patrick McEwen's work is, you know, it's tied to Buteyko, uh in Russia and, and he's uh, practical tactical, right? When you do those strategies, and we use a lot of those strategies in the um, special ops community in the military, when you do those strategies, life improves. Cognition improves, mood state improves, performance goes off the charts. Just nose breathing, closing your lips and nose breathing, especially in sleep. It makes a big difference on all of life. So that's, that's truly my number one, uh, my number one book. Amazing. I'm going to order that book after this call for sure. And what, what's the impact you want to have on this world? Oh, uh, you know, you know what I would love my, my impact to be, you know, if we, if we go out to the end of our experience here before we transition and we look back and we say, you know, what have we brought to the table? Um, you know, what I would love to have, uh, that knowing of is that I was able to expand awareness around the potential that humans have, right? So that we, we no longer believe ourselves to be fragile and uh, limited, so that we could, you know, transition out of this experience and say, man, I left it all on the table and I loved every minute of it. That's what I would love to see more and more people experiencing. Well, Micra, this has been an amazing conversation with you. I hope we talk again very, very soon. Oh, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. I love your community. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode today. I hope you learned from this episode that you can apply in your life. If you did enjoy this, please subscribe to the podcast, The Nishan Garg Show on Apple Podcast. You can also subscribe to the show through my website, https colon slash slash nishangarg.me, N-I-S-H-A-N-T-G-A-R-G dot me. You can also share this podcast with your family and friends or whoever want to feel fulfilled. And thank you so much again.